Dobrý deň. Dobrý deň. Komu neobchýdno vyzmieť, budú láska, naúšniky, tam bude synchronný prevod. Микрофон працює? А, працює. Дуже дякую. Я свою лекцію буду говорити по-англійськи, мені буде легше. Для тих, що не розуміють, я і доктор Михайло Самотока, травматолог, керівник центр у Шарлотт, Норт Каролайна, 650 ліжок, дуже великий центр. Хочу, щоб ви всі знали, що я приїхав тут, мої батьки з України, зі мною приїхав доктор Хадсон Беррі, американець, доктор Дуглас Дейвіс з Америки теж, і ще з нами мав бути доктор Рам Стівенс, він шість місяців на рік приїжджає на Україну вчити ультразвук. Його сьогодні, цей тиждень він не зміг, але ми стоїмо з вами, з Україною, і починаю тепер свою лекцію, коротко, маю 15 хвилин, вже був одну хвилинку. So, I would like to speak in general about the management of chest trauma and rib fractures, the evaluation and management. First of all, let's give a, a, put the perspective into context. 10% of all trauma patients uh, have rib fractures, and it represents about 30% of all chest trauma. Obviously, much more common with blunt chest trauma than with penetrating trauma. The higher the number of rib fractures, the higher the morbidity, the higher the mortality. We all know the standards for clinical diagnosis, pain on palpation, an obvious step off, crepitus to the chest, a clicking movement with deep inspiration or obvious visible chest wall deformity. The most common rib fractures are in rib fractures number seven through number 10 because those are the most exposed. And the most frequent location is in the posterior lateral curvature because that's the weakest point of our chest cavity. It's very rare in pediatric populations. I've actually had children who have been run over by a motorcycle or by a car, crush their chest and the ribs still have not broken. That's because in children, the, car the ribs are still of cartilage. The flail chest, the paradoxical movement, three or more ribs broken in two or more places. This is a good example of a patient that would improve with plating of their ribs. And now in America, we have the Chest Wall Injury Society, and we meet on a weekly basis, discuss cases, and we're still actually working through the process of who benefits from rib stabilization and who doesn't. And later in this lecture, I'm gonna try and go over some of the criteria that we use. Let's just go over quickly the radiologic diagnosis. We've already done the clinical diagnosis. A simple uh, and AP uh, chest x-ray. The advantage is it's cheap, it's quick, it can be repeated. You can see an obvious hemo or pneumothorax and you get a fairly good idea of how many ribs are broken. The downside is that it usually significantly underestimates how many of the ribs are truly fractured. It will not give you a good idea of the displacement of the ribs, and so when we're deciding whether to do stabilization of the chest cavity or not with plating, just simple chest x-ray is usually not adequate to give us an idea of what to do. And we also have a very poor view of the extent of the pulmonary contusion underneath the rib fractures when you're doing a simple chest x-ray. Some of our physicians still try to do what we call rib series, which is where we lay a patient on a bed, take an x-ray of various angles, roll the patient around in different directions. The only thing that that achieves is torturing the patient and creating more and more pain. We should ban using the chest rib series as a, a simple AP film is fine, but the full rib series has no value, no benefit whatsoever coming out in the last decade using ultrasound for diagnosing rib fractures and hemo and pneumothorax.
And this is actually Dr. Rob Stevens, who's going to be giving one of the later lectures today. He's actually going to be talking about tourniquets, but he's an expert on the epocus. And he comes through uh, Ukraine uh, giving an eight hour all day lecture on POCUS and the proper use in the intensive care unit and in the emergency room. Uh, the advantages are it's simple, it's quick, it's cheap, it's repeatable. The cons are a relatively low sensitivity, but the most important downside is that it's very operator dependent. You must develop a high level of, of skill to properly do this ultrasound, otherwise it's not beneficial. CT scan of the chest, which is what we are standard use, highly sensitive, highly specific. It gives you a detailed 3D view of where the fractures are. It identifies the extent of the underlying pulmonary contusion and other injuries, if there's injury to the aorta, the heart, the great vessels. The downside is that if a patient is too unstable for a CAT scan or a CAT scan is not available where you are, then you can't use it. Also, it's also very expensive. So just very quickly here, oh, what did I do? Oh, okay. So standard chest x-ray, you can see the multiple rib fractures, small hemothorax. And then on another patient, we have the pneumothorax, clearly outlined here, the rib fractures and the hemothorax, and also the telltale sign, if you don't see an obvious rib fracture, you can see the subcutaneous emphysema developing here. This is the E-fast pocus, which is really, hopefully over the next decade, is going to become the state of the art for diagnosing hemopneumothoraces and rib fractures. So here, you can see a normal sonogram of the chest, this is using the 7.5 megahertz linear transducer and the double arrows show you where the ribs and the pleura are in, or in contact. Here you can see using a 12 megahertz linear transducer the rib fracture and the displacement of the ribs. And then of course what we currently use as the standard the uh, CT scan of the chest outlining the rib fractures, the pneumothorax, and the, you get a very good idea of the extent of the pulmonary contusion. And then here, we just see a sternal fracture and rib fracture in the posterior. All right, when we talk about the classifications of the rib fractures, we deal with the complexity and the displacement. So for the undisplaced rib fractures, it could be a very, just a very simple fracture, a wedge fracture, or a comminuted complex fracture. When it comes to displacement, if it's 90% or less displaced, we consider it undisplaced. If it's less than 90% cortical contact, it's a simple offset uh, rib fracture. And then if there's no contact at all, it's a displaced rib fracture. We always have to concern ourselves with the other associated injuries because chest trauma frequently has other injuries associated. The one that the, carries the highest morbidity and mortality is the head injury. So traumatic brain injury plus rib fractures exponentially increases your risk of pneumonia, respiratory failure. When it comes to extremity injuries, depending on how severe the injury to, is to the chest, we may have to delay extremity fracture stabilization. And then of course in the chest we, have, we can have associated cardiac injuries, hemoneumothorax or pulmonary contusions. For injury to the lower ribs, seven through 10, which are the most commonly injured, there can also be the liver, spleen or renal injury. The associated morbidity Pneumonia, bar, bar none, is the single most important issue. We do everything possible to keep patients out of getting pneumonia. At electasis, the extent of the pulmonary contusion can be affected by how you manage your fluids in the trauma patients. This is the one class of trauma patients where we try to minimize the amount of fluid that we give them because overhydrating these patients will worsen their pulmonary contusion. Retain, oh, 
sorry. My apologies. There we go. A retained hemothorax can lead to an empyema. So proper drainage of a significant hemothorax should occur immediately when the patient arrives to the trauma bay or within the first 24 hours. The sooner you evacuate that blood, the less risk there is for development of an empyema. And then, of course, respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation and the mortality associated with the chest trauma. When it comes to the management of chest trauma, the single most important factor is adequate pain control. That is what's going to lead to a better outcome. And later on, I'm going to discuss what the options are for our management of pain in the uh, traumatized patient with chest trauma. We have a rib scoring system that's based on the pattern and it predicts your risk of pneumonia, respiratory failure, or the need for a tracheostomy. In general, what we're doing now for our patients that we know are, not, are gonna have a struggle getting off mechanical ventilation is we're trying to do tracheostomies earlier in their care within the first seven days of their admission and not beyond. The longer you wait for doing a tracheostomy, the higher their morbidity and their mortality. So when you look at this scoring system, each of these points, you get one for any one of these. And if you have a score of three or greater, it's associated with a significant increased risk of respiratory failure. So six or more fractured ribs, bilateral rib fractures, the flail chest, three or more bicortical displaced fractures, the first rib fracture because it's a short, thick bone. It takes a tremendous amount of force to fracture that or if you have multiple segmental fractures. So who goes to the ICU, who goes to the floor, and what do you do with the patients? The most important issue is for every hospital, every trauma center, to have an algorithm so that all trauma surgeons are following the same pattern of care when it comes to the treatment of chest trauma. And we have a standard protocol that all of our trauma surgeons at our hospital follow. Who's going to go to the ICU? Who's, going to, who's safe enough to go to the floor? Who's safe enough to discharge home? So the healthy 20-year-old with minimally displaced rib fractures who can cough, clear their secretions, low risk for pneumonia, he's going to be discharged home. The 65-year-old with multiple displaced rib fractures, even though that person may look well initially, is going to be put in the ICU. So what does it mean to get the criteria for going to the intensive care unit? Anybody with three or more rib fractures? Anybody over the age of 65? Anybody that has significant underlying pulmonary disease, whether it's chronic disease like COPD or the acute pulmonary contusion? Anybody with significant number of displaced rib fractures or the polytraumas? This is our algorithm for the management of traumatized patients, and let's break it down. So who gets a thoracotomy or a VATS procedure? So initially the patients will have rib fracture stabilization, I'm sorry, rib fracture management with a chest tube drainage of any hemoneumothorax, appropriate pain control, and aggressive respiratory care. All these patients, if they're physically able to, should be getting up and walking on day one of their arrival to the hospital. Mobilizing these patients, forcing them to cough, deep breathe, clear the secretions, is what improves their outcome and decreases their risk of pneumonia. So does the patient have an indication for, the, for a thoracotomy? If the answer is yes, then they're going to the OR and they'll get a stabilization of their ribs at that time. If you are planning on doing rib stabilization, it is most successful and most effective if the decision and the operation are done within 24 to 72 hours of the initial trauma. Waiting beyond that, you lose the benefit of operative intervention. And again, if a patient's pain is well controlled, they have no indication for a thoracotomy, we continue with aggressive mobilization, respiratory care, and pain control. And now when we talk about their pain management and what we do, let me go to the next slide. So just very quickly, the initial management. 
hemonomothorax gets a chest tube. We used to give antibiotics for as long as the chest tube was in place. That's no longer done. Many people will give no antibiotic at all with the insertion of a chest tube or while a chest tube is in. Others will give one dose at the time of the insertion. But what we don't want to do is breed out resistant bacteria. So with much less use of antibiotics. Fluid management, again, this is the one population of trauma patients. High risk for pulmonary edema, so we avoid hypervolemia. DVT prophylaxis, early use of anoxaprine, Lovenox, not sub-Q heparin, but Lovenox has been proven to be more effective in trauma patients. And so we're very liberal with our use of uh, anoxaprine. And we dose it based on their renal uh, function. So young, healthy 20-year-old with normal kidneys will get a higher dose of Lovenox. An 80-year-old with impaired kidney function will get a standard dose of 40 Q12. Pain control, it's a stepwise approach. So start off with around-the-clock acetaminophen Tylenol, aggressive use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and the single most important factor for proper pain control of these patients is muscle relaxants. I like Robaxin, Methocarbamol. You can pick whatever you want, Flexeril, whatever you have available. It's not the broken bone that hurts the patients. Every time they inspire, expire, the spasm of the muscle. So liberal use of muscle relaxants is probably one of the best things you can do for these patients. We try very hard to avoid the use of opioids or we use the least amount of opioids. I have a Oh, Ketamine infusion and what else is zomatic uh, uh, Lidocaine drip. Intravenous lidocaine for 24 to 48 hours is very effective for the treatment of bone fracture pain and it will be a substantial help. All right, intercostal nerve blocks. The gold standard is epidurals. If you have a good anesthesiologist and can place an epidural, that remains one of the best ways to control pain. Cryoblation, if the patient is going for a VATS or a thoracotomy, freezing the ribs where the fractures are, two ribs above and two, I'm sorry, two nerves above and two below will, will significantly improve their pain control. And then of course, incentive spirometry, aggressive pulmonary toileting, mobilizing the patients. Here's a little toy that we invented for a patient to practice breathing or the incentive spirometer. And then who gets a rib for, uh, fixation? Open fixation plates or screws or vats now we're doing. I always do cryoablation when we're doing a rib stabilization. Always try to do this within 24 or 72 hours. The relative indications are flail chest, chest wall instability, more than three fractures, greater than 50% displacement, or they meet two or more of these criteria. They're tachypnic, respiratory rate greater than 20, poor incentive spirometry, pain control that's not, that's not well controlled, more than a five out of 10 or a poor cough, or their failure to wean off the ventilator. Contraindications, if the patient is too sick for rib fracture stabilization, or they're too healthy. If they're getting better and they're getting without surgery, then we don't do rib stabilization. And when it comes to mechanical ventilation for these patients, three important things. Small tidal volume, six milliliters per kilogram of ideal body weight. We start at a high peep of eight to 10, and we want the reduced low plateau pressure. Lower is better. 16 or less is ideal on mechanical ventilation. Slava Ukraini, Hiroyam Slava. Thank you.